I have a lot of stuff to go over, and I'll go over it as quickly as possible because we'd really like to have time for um, our developers from Logan to show the CE participation form. Um, math is always an exciting topic, isn't it? And I have, you had one handout, okay? There's other handouts that we will point, we'll show you where they are on a website, but this is a handout for public education teachers and counselors, and it has to do um, with the placement for math for starting July 1st of this year. And I will tell you this, in my preparations, I have kind of an agenda that's a little bit different from the one you were handed out, so let's play bingo. When I get to the topic, just cross it off, okay? It might not be exactly in the same order. For this, I apologize. And I'm not nervous, because I know most of you, but just let me kind of spew this way, okay? Um, this handout tells you a lot of things. In the first paragraph, let me borrow a handout, make sure I get it right. In the first paragraph, uh, this was something that we handed out in the fall, and it was pointed out that it was confusing. So we rethought it, rewrote it, and talked to a bunch of different people so that it would be made more interesting. The first thing that we have to point out is to be able to take any concurrent enrollment math course, including 1010, you must finish secondary one, two, and three. We'll get to conversations about that in a minute. You must finish it with a C or better. Okay, you can't opt out of it. Board rule allows parents to opt their child out of secondary three and take another course, and that's fine, and board rule can do that. But if you want to take a college math course, including the QL courses, you must take one, two, and three. So it is higher ed, if you want to throw a tomato, it's higher ed that's saying we need to have you take all three courses. And part of it is because the core is still new. And we're teaching stuff in different order and different organization, and we don't know what completion of secondary one and two means, or one, two, and three does. One is not algebra two, one. Two is not algebra, geometry, you know? So, so the math chairs in our institutions felt very strongly that they wanted you to fi finish the entire sequence. And if you have to, throw, the t throw higher it under the bus. It's us that is requiring that, not you. Okay? First thing. The second thing has to do with ACT scores. I will point out that as our institutions had a dozen or so conversations about math courses, what was the ACT math score to get into any math course? 23, the sacred number. And it is still a 23 to get into Math 1050, and it will be, I think, probably for the near future. But if you look at the concurrent master list and or speak with your concurrent enrollment director, you will find that for Math 1010, Math 1030, and Math 1040, there are different cut scores now. It's not reflected here, but, um, but that cut score is going to make a difference and allow more students to qualify to get into 1030 and 40. I know I'm kind of rambling around. This year that we're in right now, we said you must finish three with a C or better in all three courses in order to take 10, 10, 30, or 40, or 50. We said for 10, 10, for 10, 10, okay, if you didn't have a C or better in all those courses, you could take it by taking a placement test or by having an ACT math test. And the only class that rule applied to was 10, 10. Agreed? Yes? Next year, for the year that begins July 1st, so 2017, 18, that same condition will apply to 1030 and 1040. So we still want you to take all three courses. We still want you to get a C or better. And if you do, you're golden. You're into those courses. If, however, you don't have a C or better in all those courses, you may opt to get into that class by the alternative route of a placement test or an ACT math score. It makes it easier. We were trying to make this chart so it's understandable. We were trying to compare this year to the next Latin. It just can't work. But it makes it easier to understand. And in case you care, why are we doing this? For students who are taking 1030 and 1040 math, it is most likely, oh, thank you so much. Just turn it on and let me. Does that work? Thank you so much. I'm so sorry. I don't have to shout because I am not a teacher. OK, I still need to stand near this microphone. Um, for those students, it's most likely the math last math course they're going to take. OK? So I think that was one of the reasons why people were a little bit more um, accommodating for those courses. When you get to 1050, 1050 is most likely the first class you're going to take because you're going into a subject in one of our colleges that requires you to take calculus. And 1050 is the gateway to calculus. So starting next year, all three courses, C or better. If you don't have a C or better in all three courses, take the ACT math test score. 
do a placement test. There's another way for you to get into those courses. Does this make sense? Okay, and I'm sorry when the document we had last year was a little bit confusing for folks. Um, yes. Yes, um, it's still a 23 for math 1050. And, and as far as the institutions are concerned for those 10, 10, 30, 40 courses, a couple of them have stuck with the 23s. I've seen 19s, 20s, 21s, 22s for these different courses. And, and um, I also see institutions looking at multiple measures trying to place kids in courses. The goal here is not to be pejorative. The goal is to get kids in a class where they'll be successful. Heaven forbid that we try and encourage a high school student to take a college course, and the first college course they take, they biff. My niece, who's a good kid, got a D plus in, in Math 1050. She's an art major. She should not have ever had to take that class. She would have taken 1030 or 40, she would have been fine. And she has taken 1030 and 40 at the U, and she passed. <laughs> yes? Um, do the online folks understand this notion um, of what was the question? OK, OK. Do you understand that starting next year, the condition that applied to 1010 applies to 1030 and 40? Finish secondary one, two, and three with a C or better. If you don't have a C or better, you can place into those three courses using an ACT math score or a, a placement test established by the institution. So can you repeat um, Kevin's question? I think that's what they need to do. But she did answer it. Okay. So, okay. Oh, and this is not a question but a statement. Each individual institution sets the cut score. And they said it, it, it may be different for every class. You know, it depends upon the class. Okay. Um, okay. What else is on that form? Okay. A thing I want to point out, I guess, at the very bottom of that form, and this was requested by USBE, Math 1010 is still available. And Math 1010 got, it, it was kind of, the enrollments are going down, and fall semester of 2016, it took a big, gigantic bump back up to about 16 attempted, 6,000 6, attempted credits. Math 1010 has been retooled by almost all of our institutions, and it is an appropriate prerequisite for 1050, but taking Intermediate algebra does not prepare you for statistics and doesn't prepare you for quantitative reasoning. Okay, so for those of you doing 10, 10, 10, 50, great approach if that's, if that's a helpful stepping stone for kids that are going to go into fields that require calculus, but it's not going to prepare them for statistics or quantitative literacy. And that's probably the way it always should have been. Okay? So this handout is not posted on a website at the moment. Garrett um, sends his apologies. He's at a conference and couldn't attend today. Um, I'll try and get him to post it on schoolsutah.gov. If you need it, if you need copies of it, email, and I'll send it to you. Um, we have a, a site we want to show you that's more of a student parent site, but I don't want to show this to students and parents. This is for you to understand, not for kids, OK? Because that would be confusing. So are the grants still available for Getting to it. Getting to it, yes. It's, I, okay, we're doing the agenda bingo. So that's the 17 placement, no parent opt out. It's one, the first conversation about ACT scores. We're gonna get to AP scores in a minute. Um, a thing about, um, I was gonna try and give you information on fall 2016 grades, and I, I'm sorry I don't have it. This is what I wanna say. Um, we have that C. And we're aware, I mean, it's been brought to my attention, you got a kid coming in from homeschool you got to get coming in from out of state. You still have kids who may not have finished the full sequence of courses, and they have a legitimate reason beyond their mom just didn't want them to take, or dad, didn't want them to take the third class. And I, I believe that our institutions have worked with you on those situations. But um, we have always, I'm so, you should be very proud of the fact that in the 10 years I've worked with the concurrent enrollment, there's a 5% withdrawal or failure rate in this program. And your grade spread is the same ski slope as the grade spread of kids in college. And so I think a lot of that, although we have very robust advisors on our campus who work with concurrent students, a lot of that falls on the shoulders of the counselors in high schools who work with students to select courses for concurrent enrollment. You're doing something to vet kids so that we don't have a higher withdrawal or failure rate. And we kind of counted on you, mostly, this fall to vet students as having a C or better in their courses. I will have, we will have that information from UTREX before the end of the year. So we'll be able to say, okay, what grades did Jane and John get? What grade did they get in their concurrent math course? Maybe what grade did they get in a subsequent math course? And this will begin painting a picture of what a C means in, in secondary one, two, and three. 
This is, I think, a very unique situation in that higher ed is placing students based on a high school course. We don't do that. It's a new thing. But I'm feeling pretty good with the enrollments we have that we will have more information to present back to people like the math chairs so they'll understand what it means. Um, let me give you two updates. One of these is not on your agenda. Senate Bill 168. We put this on the agenda when we were having our planning meeting. The legislative session is over, and this has been a snoozer year for concurrent enrollment. Praise the Lord. Yeah. <laughs> Senator Stevens did make a very small change to, and an appropriate change, actually, to um, the math in initiative bill. He was going to change a lot more, which is what we were going to talk about, but he didn't. All he did was strike the word Accuplacer, which was appropriate. Some of our institutions are dissatisfied with Accuplacer. They like another competitor called Alex. Other institutions want to go their own way. So now all the language says is that one way to place into um, a concurrent math course is a college placement test. And that is the sole substance of changes focused on concurrent enrollment. And we should all go home, light a candle, incense, whatever you want to do, give an extra little money in the plane on Sunday, because this is a great year for us that we didn't get a whole bunch of attention. Um, that's the update. No significant change. The update for what? What? what get, oh, sorry. I think that. The, no. Let me send it out to you, but I, have to, I want to wait till Garrett gets back from his conference on Thursday because I want to do it with him, Garrett Rose from USBE, but I believe we can send that out Friday or Monday, yes. But he, he's new to this. Um, the question was, when can we have, every year when we have contracts, and you know the deadline for district institution contracts is? May 30th. May 30th. Uh, we have to go through all the changes in legislation to make sure they're reflected. There's really no change. Um, and so we'll be able to send those contracts to the, dis the concurrent enrollment directors way early in March so they have plenty of time to get those signed. Okay? Um, update on Senate Bill 196. Um, three things I'd say to you about Senate Bill 196. One is um, Senate Bill 196 was the thing that said, um, I don't know when to add this. Nate asked me to add something. I want to say three things about it and then we'll get to it. One thing I want you to all know is it says that we need to offer more concurrent math courses in essence. There's an intent that kids are going to take a fourth year of math and there's a preference on the part of the original authors of that bill as our interpretation that that fourth year of math helped them satisfy their quantitative literacy requirements. Why not get two bangs for that buck and get that over with before you graduate from high school? Um, in order to do that, we need to have more teachers qualified, and I'm sad to say, and interested in teaching concurrent enrollment math. Because I've heard from you that it's more work to teach concurrent math. You've got to keep roles and do all this other stuff. But it's not like you get the prefer preferential parking spot next to the front door of the high school. And, um, and so one of the things our institutions have done, and, and I'll just say it to you, is they have started working on teacher prep programs. Each institution is different. Some are encouraging teachers to take graduate courses to work towards a master's in math, and they'll help pay the tuition. They're trying to schedule things properly. Others, um, uh, you know, a, a summer colloquium kind of a thing. But you should ask your concurrent element director what your partner institution is doing with regard to teacher prep. That's one thing. And there's no point in going into detail because it's too grand, and, and you need to talk to the person that you partner with. The second thing that we did, um, in January, uh, well, actually, for spring semester that we're in right now, it was just started what we called the Prep Period Initiative. Um, I got from Kristen Campbell at the State Board of Ed that there are 1,441 level four math endorsed teachers in the state. Only 153 of them teach concurrent math. Let's just find another 50. You know, that's all we need to do is find a few more. In the, and in truth, in the last four years, when I look at end of year information, the number of earned credits in concurrent math has actually been on the decline, even as our enrollments have been going up. And, and so one of the things we envisioned, and, and from advice from a couple of LEAs, was let us find teachers who are willing and interested in spending their prep period to teach another concurrent math course, they have to be qualified to do it, and we will pay the contract to the district as well as, as a stipend to the institution for that to work. In spring of this year, with like four weeks announcement, we had, I'm looking to Megan, five sections? Yeah. We had five sections, and we, that, those five sections had how many students? 
20 and 35 students a section. So we figured if our goal was to get more students to take math, we did a really good job with that initiative. We weren't sure at the time that we ha would have funds to continue, but we do. And so if you have a teacher in your district who w is interested in being paid to take his or her prep period to teach a concurrent math course, and they're qualified, um, you should talk to your concurrent enrollment director and ask if that's possible and doable. Okay, yes. I, I've heard, uh, I think Doug Johnson was telling me that the rural superintendents in the south part of the state have agreed to align their class schedules at their high schools so that every Monday is an A day and every Wednesday is an A day, Tuesday, Thursday is B, and Friday flips back and forth. Um, that, so, the first, the first question I had is, who's doing that? Is there someone in the southern end of the state that agreed to align their ABDs so that they could do this? Can you tell us? Severe's doing it? With whom? Kane? Wayne School District? Anyone else? The, the reason I ask that, there's, there's two advantages that that yields. Sorry, I there's, there's two advantages that that yields. The first is it allows the, the students at the high schools to take classes on campus at a local college with less disruption to their schedule. The second thing it allows you to do is when high schools are synced up with each other, it allows you to share instruction through video conferencing, either from your college provider or if you've got a qualified teacher at one school, they can share that class with another school. I'm just, I, I guess I'm curious to get a feel, is there a broader desire to try and do that across the state, or is that something that we don't even want to try and push? Because <coughs> it would open up a lot of opportunities for the students, but I also understand that when you start messing with people's calendars, they get a little touchy. At least you use the word calendar and not bell schedule. <laughs> Comments, anyone? No. I think it would be great. I mean, you get the consistency of always knowing that these are your A days and these are your B days and, and uh, these are your instruction on those days. I'm, I, I personally think that rotating A, B days eats up people's time. It eats up more time than anything. And plus, if they have a, if they have a assembly and all these other kind of things, it really eats up a lot of time. I'm not, I'm not so sure, Sid, that, that in the bigger districts that you're talking to the right people that can make those decisions. There's, there, it's, such a, it's such a big deal that it involves many more people than what we're dealing with. In a smaller district, it might be, it might be a smaller conversation and an easier change to make. But a, a bigger district, yeah, it's, that's tough. I was, more than anything, I was curious about those who have done it, what's their experience been, and is it worth pursuing at a larger level? Have you done it or are you planning on doing it? They're doing it next year. Okay. Well, then I think we need to look to Wayne, Severe, and Kane and see how that works. You know, I think um, you have four rural service districts and maybe a kind of a, maybe not a statewide solution, but a kind of uh, regional solution might be a, might work for them. I did your bell schedules about four years ago. There are no two bell schedules alike. It's so crazy um, how you how you organize your schedules, and it's because of things like buses. I it's not that you can fix it. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Okay. So Dixie found a professor on campus teaching online no, at, the at the Hurricane Center who taught Monday, Wednesday, week one, Tuesday, Thursday, week two. And so, so to match the school schedule. Interesting. So if we get positive feedback, then maybe that's something we can sell to some of the other professors, especially if we can offer two sections of the same class right. so that to the professor it feels the same. I teach from this time to this time, Monday through Friday. Okay. Okay, I, I was asked to bring up a, a, a final topic, which wasn't even on my agenda that you're playing agenda bingo with. So I've talked about teacher prep and the prep uh, in a prep period initiative. Please talk to your um, CE directors about that. Um, 
We have interesting interpretations of the legislation that led to these math initiatives. And what I said to you earlier, and this is what's up on the screen, this is, was Senate Bill 196, which turned into 53A-1-1301. And what it said, what we lobbed onto was in addition to other math graduation requirements established by the Board of Ed, a student can fulfill one of the following. AP, IB, sorry you guys. <laughs> That's a CLEP test. I mean, who t I didn't know they hadn't had CLEP anymore. AP, IB, CLEP, an ACT math score, or a concurrent course with a C or better. That's what we interpreted saying, that's what we want you to be taking senior year. And um, the ACT math score, by the way, a 26 on the ACT math will satisfy QL at our institutions. That was another first for us, because we waive prerequisites, but we don't always satisfy requirements. Am I right about the 26, you guys? Did I say it right? Thank you. But then we kept on talking to our partners in public ed, and they pointed out another statute to us. And I want to ask the public ed folks to help us with this. Oh. Can you scroll this? This is your 277-700-9, uh, which talks about a senior student with special circumstances. And that says that before the beginning of senior year, they've got to do all that stuff. And if they don't, what? It's okay. Oh, it's, so, it's okay. What it says is if they, if they haven't finished the APIB club concurrent enrollment, before the beginning of senior, they can be tagged as a student with special circumstances, and they must take a year-long math course, which includes um, a lot of courses on your A, is it AAF list? That's not the right, was it AAF? I, you know, that, that aren't QL courses. And so, what what are can public ed, can you tell us what you're hearing about that and what's your messaging because we're trying to push the three QLs and we're kind of getting messages that no we don't have to do that anymore. Comments or questions? Anybody? Besides the pain to report on? Oh yeah, the, the pain to report on I get. Yeah, and what I what I also get is that nobody in this room and nobody in the legislature I, to the best of my knowledge wants to label a child not college going or not college ready um, that may be there may be language and statute to that effect but that is not the desire the desire is actually we're very very much aware of the fact that for some kids the single largest stumbling block to finishing a college certificate or degree is their dang math class and it's because they took a year or two and the stuff's rusty and they go into the class and the, you know I, I've told you all about my daughter's experiences with, with uh, Math 1030, right? I told you all this. Her first night, she was sitting next to a cute boy, and they asked a question in Math 1030. There's three apples in a bowl, three kinds of apples in a bowl. You pick three, one of each kind. How many more apples do you have to pick to get a pair of the same apple? And she turned to the young man, and his response was, don't ask me. I've taken 1010 10, three times and failed it. I'm finally into 1030, and it's my last class to graduate. So math can be a huge stumbling block. We have a mathophobic society. So we're trying to encourage kids to take math when it's still fresh, when they're a senior. Since Holly had a, Holly had a comment that year. Holly, comment. Take it. Oh, I'll use my Wait teacher voice. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sid, I think you're referring to um, these kids that aren't ready for the QL classes, and we do offer classes in the high school that will give them a math course as a senior, not necessarily something that would prepare them for college-level math, but if they're not ready, they're not ready, and like you said earlier, the last thing we want to do is set a kid up for failure. Threw us for a loop was the language says at the beginning of senior year if they haven't finished concurrent math, and I'm going no they should be ready at the beginning of senior year to take concurrent math or something else. So, so I hope in this room we're talking about encouraging students to take the three QLs. I encourage any of my sons take an AP calculus next year. So AP or IB or CLEP is good too, but that we hope that as many students as are ready and prepared take a class that resolves the QL for them. Nate. I think that the big change that I heard was when we originally saw the legislation, everybody was talking about our students will have to do this to graduate from high school. And with this new rule, it's, well, they really don't have to. They just have to take a fourth year of math. So when, when we were talking to the districts we work with, 
we were asking, well, why, why isn't there more of a sense of urgency around QL, students taking QL? And the response was, well, it's because they don't have to. Well, according to board rule, that's true. They don't have to. So uh, I was just curious if, if that was being pushed out as an official message by the districts or if it was a, we're just not going to talk about this very much. I'll answer that. I think most districts are actually concerned with graduation data. And so that's the big concern that they have. And the QL requirements and these other things, that's gravy, but that's not necessarily the big focus of, their, of them and their efforts with their students. OK. Let's move on. <clears throat> so when the students come to us, they um, get put in, if they're matriculated, heading towards a degree, they get put into the system and they start checking off their gen eds. And so for this math QL change up at the higher ed level, when they get that 26 on the ACT, they're going to be automatically checked off on that QL. The problem that we may face in concurrent enrollment or even for higher ed is that the students may still need a 1050 or a 1040 or a 1030 for their major to graduate. So it'll look like they don't have to because that big checkoff goes on the, um, on the system, and, but yet they may still need it for their major. Um, they've checked off gen ed side, but not their major. Um, what we've been sort of talking about as a group of advisors is if kids are in, let's say, 1050 in concurrent enrollment, and all of a sudden they see in their portal that they're now checked off for QL, they may drop out of 1050 thinking they're, they didn't need it. But they need to get that advising on the other end for their major. So get them in touch with the, um, the college advisors to see if they're going to need it in possibly their career field, their majors. The sciences are um, one area that I can think of that they would still need that um, course, not just the 26 on the ACT check off on the gen ed. So that's one thing we've been kind of trying to work around. How about as a QL, so if somebody has the score, 26, it meets their QL requirement, they go on a mission or into the military for a couple of years to come back, does that 26 have that QL you know, shelf life? It satisfies the 26. It would not necessarily count as a prerequisite. Okay. QLs, gen ed's gen ed, you're done. But not necessarily after two years is the prereq. I just want to yes. clarify that we're talking about 26 in math. Ma oh, math. the Sorry, ACT no subscore. Yes, so math. The, the math score is 26. Yeah. Now, okay, I'm blasting through. This, okay, this is an interesting question. Look at this pie chart here. I can show it to you. I want to quickly talk to you about the exploratory pathway and then move on quickly because we don't have time. Um, this shows that we had 15, almost 16,000 credits that weren't awarded in those three courses um, last year the year that ended July of last year. And this is the enrollments in 1030, 2% 2 in 1030, 6% 6 in 1040, 92% in 1050. This was one of the discussion points we had talking about math. 92% of our students are not going into STEM or a field that requires calculus. I don't know what the percentage is, but 92 is just seems a little too high for us when you look at how students are spread across majors on our campuses. And so this led us to say, what can we do and taking up this challenge from Senate Bill 196 to promote the fact that there's three courses that satisfy QL, not one. And so, and I'm going to point you to a website that I'm going to say type in utahce.org and you'll be redirected to a very long website and step up that we're building as a placeholder for things. It's got three areas in it. I'm very proud of the fact Megan and other people wrote this and um, we put, we're putting it up. YCE, what courses should I take and how do I start? And the YCE is, you know, an answer to parents about what's, how, how cool the program is. But in the section of what courses should I take, there are the Gen Ed Pathway document, which we know you love and admire and it's dear. We had 69% of our earned credit was in Gen Ed last year. This is next year's document. And over here we have the CE Exploratory Majors Pathway document, which is a newer beast. You've all heard about it before. 
But in an effort to promote the fact that there are three QLs, not one, we came up with an explanation. If you look at a college cal uh, catalog and see how we describe math courses, it's just a list of competencies. You know, I, I can't think of a trig. Um, I can't think of math competencies now because I'm stressed. Um, differential equations, that's a good one. <laughs> but uh, one of the people actually was the math chair on this campus wrote for us some slightly more narrative or descriptive, uh, 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 more of a narrative explanation of what concurrent is and it's uh, what the math courses are. And it says, if you're going into humanities or social science, take 1030 or take 1040. Um, I will say again, if you change majors, the world will end if you have to take another math course. There are far more students, and I can't remember the statistic, that will start in a STEM field and end in a non-STEM field and go the opposite direction. So we attempted to say, here's these three courses, here's the kind of student that should be taking those courses, and then we did the same thing as the Gen Ed Pathway document. We organized, first of all, these courses are organized into the Holland vocational or career code personalities that y'all teach in your eighth grade college and career readiness course. But for each one of those very, very broad pathways, we recommended a QL. Our institutions are working, some of them fast and furious, to actually associate a quantitative literacy course with every certificate and degree program out there. Some are farther along than others. Obviously, if you're going to go into engineering, it's 1050, but if you go into human economics, which one is it? You know, some of them are not quite as cut and dry. Um, as they put that information up and as that they share that with us, we'll put it into the major's guide, et cetera. But for now, for a student who's in eighth or ninth grade thinking about concurrent enrollment, not necessarily deciding what they're going to be when they grow up, this is a broad, way, a broad category and a way for them to think about QL math. We're wanting to, to at least think that there's three choices. Um, I give as my example my daughter, my niece. My niece is not sure what she's going to be when she grows up, but she is not going to be a STEM major. My son can't write a sentence. He's going to be a STEM major. He dinks with computers. He takes the phone apart, the toaster, everything. He's going to be doing something more of a, that kind of a bent. And so, so this is one way for us to promote three QLs. Yes, sir. kids who met the standard for 1050 were then successful in our 1050 class. So it's not like we had a bunch that were failing. We thought, well, what, what should we do with these kids? There was, there was never a reason. And so 1050 was the one that made the most sense because it covered everybody. Now that they can get into 1030 and 40 without 23, then, it'll, it'll, then, we'll be, then we'll be asking some questions about what's the best place for them. It takes some serious advising. I agree with you. And you know, one of... Oh, um, the point is it was easier to counsel kids when you had one pathway. No, there wasn't, that's not, that's not much of a okay, say it again. Yeah. So in, yes, in, in other words, yeah, if they met the highest requirement possible, we counseled, counseled them into that highest level requirement class. Anyway, right. So now, that, now that we have a new group of kids who said, okay, now 30 and 40, you don't have to have 23, we'll, we'll start off. Yeah, and you know what? It's not, I, I don't want to say that it's um, easier math. My daughter took IB math, so she didn't take 1050, she took IB math, but she's a social work major and she had to take statistics at the U. So, so if she had taken that as a concurrent student, she wouldn't have had to take it at the U. But for her major, they don't want, um, they don't want uh, 1050. So I hate to say this is dummy math, but I also, um, I also think that the two math courses, 1030 and 1040, are more applied. And I can only speak with my two kids. I'm sorry, I only got two of them. But, but um, my daughter works better in an applied setting. My son's more theoretical. And, and, and so different students will fare better in that course, whether it's harder or easier or not. But, but it gets them to start thinking about their pathways. OK? Um, the Gen Ed Pathway document, the um, Trans uh, Exploratory Pathway document, are listed on utahce.org. This will be the place where you access the participation form. This will be the place where we put the concurrent master list up as a database. Because I know you love Excel spreadsheets, and you know how much I love Excel. But we're going to make it easier to manage that and for you to say, let me show me all the stuff from Snow, show me all the stuff from Slick. 
And so that's going to be up in the next two or three weeks. Let me say, now I'm supposed to give you a legislative update really quick. Okay. How many of you are familiar with the boards, the State Board of Ed's movement to um, do grade replacement? Okay, a few of you are. Um, the State Board was making a move. Now, I'm going to say this wrong, so Mari, if, any, if I say it incorrectly, correct me. If a student didn't do well in a class and wished to petition, they could have that class expunged from a high school transcript and take it over again? Yeah. Okay, okay. And the question was asked when this came to us, how will this affect concurrent enrollment? And the answer is, our colleges will not expend a college transcript if a student doesn't want to do well. There'll be a W on that transcript. This can create problems. We won't be able to do the data match. We won't transfer money. But beyond that, it could have implications for students' financial aid in the future. And so I called this morning to talk to Travis Cook at State Board and learned that for various reasons, that discussion was tabled. And that discussion has not gone away yet, but nothing has been done about that. So if you've heard about it, they're still thinking about it. Um, at our institutions, you have the capacity to withdraw from a course. And you will get, after a certain date, you can get it expunged just as if you weren't even in the class. But after a certain date, you get a W. And the W doesn't count to your GPA, but it indicates that you were in the class and for whatever reason withdrew. And so the State Board is fomating on the fact that's how we do it in higher ed, and maybe they'll come up with a similar path. But for now, that's not an option. It gives me an opportunity to remind you that board rule and region policy mirrors, mirrors board rule says that students must shoot. What must satisfactorily complete, I can't think of the exact wordings, but you've got to earn credit in the concurrent class for the appropriation to flow. And for that reason, we need a letter grade. Kids can't do credit, no credit, unless that's the only option. They cannot get incompletes. And every year we only get a couple dozen, but they're always from teachers. Because they go into the systems where they report grades and I is an option, but it's not for concurrent enrollment for the near future, forever. I'm also supposed to give an update on the general financial literacy endorsement, and this comes from Travis Kick Cook, who is in charge of the literacy endorsement. September 2016, and I'm going to quote him because he, the obligation for a formal financial literacy endorsement became effective. So as of September, before September 2015, anyone who wanted to teach general financial lit, which is our personal finance course, could teach it. And as of September 2016, they have a formal it's their 15 or 16 credit endorsement package, just like any other endorsements that you would get. Um, they let it go this year, and if I'm correct, we had 25 teachers teaching personal finance. It's one of the top 10 enrolling courses in concurrent enrollment, but only 12 of those or 13 of those teachers have the have what the coursework it takes to have the endorsement to teach general financial literacy. And so, as of July 1st of this year. The State Board will be endorse, enforcing that required endorsement. And so I would suggest I will put up, I'll send out to um, Jared the URL that Travis gave me for you to see this endorsement requirement for general financial lit, and you can look it up. So you understand that from <laughs> the K 12 side? Yes. The K 12 endorsement is, is what we're talking about there. So if you're a district, <laughs> LEA, and your teachers are not endorsed to teach general financial literacy, which they changed the standards and the requirements for that recently, then they will not be allowed to give concurrent enrollment credit either. So you need to go back with the HR department in your districts and make sure that those general financial literacy teachers are in, in fact endorsed by the new state qualifications. Can you put this on your camera thing? Yeah. Final update for legislative. Um, it was asked, and we were asked to see if we could update on the region's scholarship, okay? Here's the update. Can you see it? Okay. Basically, there is no impact on graduates of 2017 or 2018, okay? Same thing. No impact. So for the kids that graduate this June or next June. But beginning with the class of 2019, region scholarships awarded are provided, awards are provided as part of a package with other state aid and may not exceed tuition and fees, students must fill out a FAFSA. We have students who received the Regents Award. Can you do it? I, don't really I think it looks it funky that way. Oh, jeez. Well, you can be reversed. You can read backwards. <laughs> um, you get the Regents Scholarship. You get another scholarship from an institution. You get another scholarship from a private entity. And the lump sum of all the scholarships exceeds what it costs you to attend that institution. And to stretch dollars, I mean, more kids apply for that scholarship every year, and to stretch legislative dollars further, 
This money is going to wind up going to institutions, and it's going to be there as like a bank account for you. And if you've got other awards, great. And when those other awards are walk, uh, when those other awards are exhausted, if you still have money to show the institution, they'll dip into that bank account and pay. But you won't walk away with more money than the cost of attendance of the institutions. I'm sorry, folks. Might be a work couple. And. That was the only slide they gave me. I think the significance is, um, Julie, could, Julie partly couldn't come today. She's going to be here tomorrow. But it doesn't go into effect this year or next year, so there'll be more time for you to learn about it. But it will be packaged with the other words you get so that the max you can get is what costs you to attend that institution. OK? Does that include housing and other costs like that? That's a good question, and I don't know the answer. I was wondering. I think um, right now it doesn't, because the most you can get is $6,000. So it's tuition fees and maybe books. But I don't know the answer. Yeah, but you could use the excess if you yes. get full tuition to use towards things like housing. And, and that's one. I apologize because Julie sent this to me and I couldn't get her on the phone. But I will get you more information between now and 2019. I think it will be on their website. Yes, John. Does that, that apply to New Century as well, sir? Does that apply to New Century? I'll make a phone call and let you know in five minutes. I don't know. I've let you down. I'll find out. Okay. Can we take a five-minute break? Yes. Can we take a five-minute break? Most of you can't get out of the room, but we would like to have the developers from um, uh, Logan come up and set up their computer so that we can demonstrate the concurrent enrollment participation form. Okay? Any questions about legislative update? That was a, so much information to cover in a half an hour. Okay. All right. Thanks, Sid. I, I actually hadn't met Sid until today, so we talked hundreds of times on the phone, but first time I met her. So I think I let her down when I introduced myself. I wasn't six four and everything. So um, I appreciate all you do. I've got. If you'll just let my last two daughters graduate from high school, I'd be much appreciated. And then we'll work on getting them into college. So. Um, I'm Steve Funk. I work for Utah State University. Um, I would like to really quickly introduce my team. Um, they've come down with me today. They've helped develop this. Matter of fact, they've done the majority of the heavy list lifting. So um, we've got, we'll just have the three of you stand up real quick. So we've got going from left to right. We've got Nick, Nicholas, um, Mary, and Shannon. Shannon, raise your hand so they know. Okay. <laughs> okay. So they have done the majority of this, and I appreciate them and, and Sid, and we've had a lot of input. Daryl Harris from Utah State. So let's r run through this form real quick. Um, the first part of this is the information that they're going to need in order to successfully complete this application. Um, the four bullet points are the things that they need to make sure that they have in hand or with them in order to part or to complete it. So they're going to need a social security number or student visa or alien registration number. They're going to need their parent or guardian with them. They are going to need a credit or debit card in order to pay the the application or the participation form fee as well as um, an email account. So let's run through this. Are we all trustworthy? I'm going to put my daughter's information in because this is actually going across the Utrecht's database. So um, I'll take that as a yes. So, so we're so my daughter's in high school, and if I can type, and I don't know her name. Um, um, you can see we are doing some validation as we go through this, making sure that we get a proper phone number. Um, now, as Sid mentioned, the first name, the last name, the gender, the high school, And then the the birth um, birth date information. So we 
We do have here on here that just so because this is open to the public so that we don't have um, forms filling this out and I am actually going to bypass this. We have it disabled right now and we're going to continue. So right now this is sending off an email to that student's email address in which they just put in there and it's going to email them a verification code that they must enter in so that we know who we're talking to. Um, Yes, please. When you typed in first name, last name, birth date, gender in high school, it ran oh, yes. an API to your track. So it said, can we find this student? In this case, we found the student. So the student's going to continue on. Okay, so that's running in the background, which is why there was like that two-second pause before you went into the next form. Um, and it also, if in fact we can find that student, we can find that student's SSID. And if we can find the SSID, we can get a transcript. If we can get a transcript, we can also get math scores. So we can automate did they get a C or better in math? So finding the student in Utrex is the first thing that we're trying to do. Go ahead. Well, we found her. Yeah, so we have found her. We've got her, her, her SSID from the state. Um, we're going to put in the, the verification code. And it has been successfully verified. And so now we are going to continue on. So at this point, we're going to put in, um, well, we better put in some Okay, we do ask for ethnicity and race, but they are not mandatory fields. So any field that is has a red asterisk by it is a mandatory field, and that information has to be submitted in order to continue on that process. So I'm going to select that she is a U.S. citizen, and I am actually just going to make up a Social Security number. I hope that is not yours. And... We're going to put in when she anticipates graduate, when her parents think she's going to graduate. And then, then we are going to, and I'm going to put in my email address. And I can select whether I want text messages or receive information um, from the institution. Of Bottom of this page is a FERPA question. Do you claim your child on taxes? Um, if a child is claimed as a dependent on taxes, the parent can call and ask for directory information. First name, last name, is my student enrolled in courses and how much money do they owe? The problem is, and it's a conundrum, how do I know it's you on the phone? So we're asking the question, and I pose it back to the AG's office, what good does this do us? When your parent calls, there needs to be like a secret password or something. Uh, or a student present to answer that question. But we're going to ask it. It was on the state form, but it's a problem. Okay, so we've, we've got all that information in here. Um, it is now going to send off an email to my account and ask me to verify my account as a parent. Well, first of all, we added one thing. Um, this is going off to the United States Postal Service to get your verify that your mailing address was correct. That was a request put in by one of the C CIOs in, at the state institutions. So now we're going to put in our verification code. And We've successfully put in our verification code. Now we are going to come to the um, concurrent enrollment disclosure form. Now, this is the parent permission that you are gathering the paper and pencil on. This will gather this um, electronically instead. <coughs> so this, the Board of Ed and the Board of Regents agreed that we would begin gathering this form for you. Okay. okay. So we're not going to take the time to read all this, but I'm sure every one of you will, and every parent and student will. Okay, so we're going to sign this both for her and for me. And then we're going to hit continue. I believe there might have been one or two word changes here, but since that form was approved by the AG's office and then it was voted on by the Board of Education, they approved the form. We, uh, it should look very much like the form you did paper and pencil, except that that 
perfect question is now on the previous page. The reason it was moved to the previous page is that's the page where we can feel most confident that the parent is actually present because they had to receive a verification code on their phone. My son doesn't know how to get into my phone yet, but he figured it out his dad. So, so hopefully that's, that's a good place to put that question. Go ahead. All right, so at the very start, we asked the, the student for what their high school was. And part of the reason for that, other than to verify some information with the state's database, was we, we need to know what high school they're with so that they, we know what institutions they're able to do concurrent enrollment through. And so I realize the colleges that are going to be listed here are not completely accurate. Maybe they are. I don't know. Um, so she got... She goes to Skyview High School. She has two options in this case to go to take concurrent enrollment from Utah State University or Weber State. And the institutions have a dashboard where they identify the high schools and the districts that they partner. Yeah. So every you know every year you, you partner a lot. Ninety-five percent the same, but every year you have a little shifting. So they will have identified them. Okay. So in this, I, I've selected a semester. Um, if the institution chooses to provide a promo code, they can do so. And I've, I've got one that's going to save me 50%. And so I've knocked my price down a little bit. And I agree that this for, the fee I'm paying is, is non-refundable. <coughs> So once I hit enter here, it, oh, let me back up just a little bit. If I want to enroll to more than one or apply to more one institution, I can do so and, and pay for that. So I'm not going to, but um, then it's going to pop up and it's going to ask you to review your, your concurrent enrollment application details, what institution, the semester, and the fee that's being paid. We are using PayPal to go out and collect those fees. You can have either a PayPal account or you can just have a credit or debit card. Either one of those will work. So I'm going to click on Pay with PayPal. Now, this particular instance is going against what's known as PayPal Sandbox, which is painfully slow. This is really quick on their production. So I apologize for the delay here. Um, and we are going to pay. Here we have, if we have a PayPal account, we can pay with our PayPal account, or we can come in and we can select pay using a debit or credit card, and we can pay with that, just put in that debit or credit card without a PayPal account. I am actually going to pay with this demo PayPal account, and we are going to make payment. And once this is complete, it's going to verify our information or our account that we're going against and we say pay now. This is now verified that the funds have been received through PayPal, by PayPal and those funds will then flow back to the institution in which they are applying to. Um, at this point they are now completed. They've got their confirmation number. An email has now been sent to both the student's email account as well as the parent's email account with all the confirmation information that they need. And so this is essentially, well, this is the process for, a, or will be the process, I guess, for students to enroll in concurrent enrollment. Once they finish this form for the first time, there's, you know, once they finish this form for the first time, the commissioner's office, the Board of Regents is done with the process. Institutions, they're having a meeting on Thursday to talk about this. Institutions will pick up the student information that was gathered, their address is verified through the Postal Service, which is probably cool. And, and the student will receive the welcomes, the banner IDs, and the instructions on registering, and will receive the decision to admit. I think that um, most of our institutions admit stu concurrent students, and they, they each have a different formula. Some look at transcripts, some don't. This is a new world. Because in partnering with um, USBE, we're in a position to get electronic transcripts. Um, we're in a position to get other information about students. Uh, and so who knows if our institutions over time, if their process or their criteria for approving will change, okay? They fill this, every student will fill this out this time. And one thing I will point out, um, you've got, oh, I'm sorry, you guys. I'm sorry people 
on the phone, I said gibberish just a minute ago. Every student will fill it out this first year. We've backloaded, or Steve's backloaded. <laughs> We will. <laughs> we'll backload the database with three years worth of concurrent students. So if you took a class last year, we assumed you were admitted and you paid and you took the class, whether you earned credit or not, um, whether you got a W or not. We will also add uh, what we call the mid-year report. Y'all are familiar with it, which is summer and fall of this year, spring third week, which we got about two weeks ago in our office. And then we will be asking admissions offices to provide us with a report of students who between end of year last year and this year who have applied but haven't taken a class yet because there will be students that fit into that category. I mean, there's students that apply for concurrent enrollment and then for whatever reason scheduling can't get the concurrent class and don't take it. Because when we pass that fee onto the institutions, that's, that will be considered the application fee. And as you know, students paying an application fee only pay it once. Sometimes the parents pay every semester. If you come back to this form next semester, it'll say, well, you've already paid. We don't need that again. Um, and so, so we're trying to think smart about problems that have happened in the past to avoid them, but we do have this issue of kids who we're going to try and capture as many have already paid. On the last screen, there's a little check the box saying, I've already paid the app fee, and that will signal our institutions to check that student out. Yes? Yes, a parent, uh, okay, I'll be honest. The State Board of Ed wants a parent permission from every year, and I understand it. I would not want to approve my kid to participate in a program when they were in eighth grade or ninth grade, and then just let them continue to participate for multiple years. Um, there's a problem there, because we have parents' phone number, we have kids' phone number, hopefully we have parents' email, hopefully kids' email, hopefully we have four for almost all these students, and we'll send out the commissioner's office, the Board of Regents, to send out a notice at the end of the year, because we'll know also from State Board of Ed who was the senior and who's graduated, okay? So if you weren't a senior and you took a concurrent course or you signed up, we'll send you a notice saying, are you thinking of taking concurrent enrollment next year? You need to get permission again. Verify the information. There's no, they don't create accounts here or passwords. Verify, we'll send a verification to your email, and you've been to websites to do that, and we'll shoot you over to that parent permission page. We'll val validate the parent's email and phone number and get permission to participate. The problem that I see is, <laughs> how do I connect that back up to the institutions? How have you ever connected the pieces of paper back up to the institutions? And so, I'm not putting that off. I, um, we were charged with doing this assignment. Where This is a homework assignment for us. We're doing it to the best of our knowledge and, uh, and to the best of our abilities. But I, and we, I'll be able to say we tried our darndest, but I don't know what we're going to do if we can't get students. So, but Parents, the permission. Is to have them fill it out every year. Yeah. 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 If they go back, you know, Snow is doing such a nice job of storing rural, rural parts of the state. I've been taking classes from Utah Valley, and I decided to take a class from Snow College spring semester. Um, the option for any other institution that I have available to me at my high school will be there. Um, but so we, you know, you might not know at the first of fall semester when you, what classes, what institutions you're going to partner with. So, um, so, but if you've already paid. And we're gonna, we have to keep student records in, this, uh, in a secure environment until they graduate from high school. The day they graduate is the day they can no longer participate in concurrent enrollment, so we can you know, jettison them. But if they came back the next year and wanted to add on a different school, then they would Yes, be absolutely. But this, is, this is taking place, this is re replacing the actual CE application that each of In my wildest dreams, the information that's conveyed to the institution is what they were asking. And it goes into Banner magically, magically, and Banner does the heavy lifting of saying, you're in, you're not in, someone has to look at your transcript, whatever, um, and, and makes the determination and sends in the notification. One of the great concerns of our institutions was um, time lag. And we can't put, make it take three or four days for that file that's been gathered to get into Banner at the institution the students have selected. And that is a topic of conversation with the IT folks on Thursday, but um, it has to be a blip in time or it will be a problem. Because as we know, many students, they don't get their schedule until the very, like August. And they don't want to register or apply to an institution to take concurrent courses until they know for sure they got in. And um, 
we can encourage early enrollment and we're going to get it early early declaration with a lot of students we can get it but i still think there's a whole bunch of them are going to say i'm going to wait and see i don't know yes sir uh, there's there's two things that i'm concerned about this is a policy kind of question why are we requiring them to declare citizenship and is that going to have a chilling effect in the current Climate. I'm going to let you answer that. Oh, he's, yeah, because you all ask it on your applications for admissions. You know something? I, um, and our, the CE directors asked a question about DACA students, which I have a partial answer from, helped thanks to Liz, but not a complete answer. There's one thing that I think there's a word or two that's missing on the stupid first page. Um, Utah State has a very elegant way of asking citizenship. If you say you're a U.S. citizen, it asks for your social. If you say you're a... Um, permanent resident alien, it asks either for your social or your permanent resident alien number. If you are a, an international student, it asks for your visa number. If you're an asylee, it asks for whatever your asylees have. If you're an undocumented student, it doesn't ask for anything. So that first sentence should say your social security visa number or permanent resident alien number if you have one. And I thought we had that. Well, I'm wondering if we could say under the required citizenship field. Yeah. Oh. That will help. It's still not going to get rid of the people who are afraid of ICE. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. But the, the second question I had, uh, Judy Peterson told me on Friday that the Granite Foundation pays thousands of dollars each year in student application fees. And in a lot of cases, that's done through the school's P card. How is this process going to work if the students there? The school's paying with a P card. The parent does not have a personal email account because we've got a lot of students where that's the case. Um, that, Doug, Doug gave me a challenge the other day for Snow College that I've been able to resolve my mind. That one I'm going to have to work out. Um, they have to have a phone number. Are we making them have a phone number or an email account or both? They, the student has to have an <coughs> both. The student has both. Numbers. And the student but may the put a phone number, home phone number. Back. Parent has put an email, but not a phone number. Okay. Maybe we should. Okay. We've got, we've got families with neither email nor debit or credit cards. That's that's what I'm concerned about. Okay. Do they register in person? Yes, they do it in person. Do they do like a dummy account? Okay. Can't, can't this, so the question is, can we as an institution? create another way to do this without forcing them to go through the participation form online? That question's, yeah, that question's been asked, and the answer at this point is no. Okay, so then the tool needs to be able to accommodate Okay. People. Okay. Stop. Hold the question for just a minute. And you two questions. That's, you brought a good, hold the questions. You brought a good um, question up. I want to do this because we're going to run out of time. I want to go back through the form again. And I want to ask especially a question of the people that are public ed, how we, ha how we can best handle students whose first name, last name, birthday, gender, and high school don't match Utrex, because they can't get anywhere if they don't have that. And then we'll come back to yours. So can you give them that example? Yes. So going back to the question earlier, I put my daughter back in. It shows that she has registered for, she's paid for Utah State University. She can opt to select another institution and that the other institution that's available to her is Weber State University. So, so this is if I were to go back in as her and as a, or a, as a parent to, and thinking I needed to apply again or pay again. If you click on that just so we can see it, does show them uh, an application fee. I mean, down on Weber State. Oh. oh. Yeah. If you click on that, yeah, it would pay. It would then whatever Weber yeah, State's. Are we just putting numbers that in? Answers my question. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so let me come back to this. And this is the question that we really need um, you to foam it on. If a student goes in, and go ahead and start doing it. If a student goes in and types in a first name, last name, birth date, gender, or high school that doesn't match what's in Utrex, which is, Utrex is, of course, the database that the LAs report to, right? They're going to get an error message saying that it doesn't match, that we can't find you in Utrex. And so. Yeah, wrong year. Okay, so all of this information is when it hits the Utrex database. Um, so 
every piece of this information is correct. So why am I not getting back a record with Utrex? Well, in our family, we call her Katie. At school, she's known as Katie. But her real legal first name is Katharina. So it's not going to find her by Katie because that's not her legal name as recorded with the state. So if I come back here and I now put in. That's an unusual name. Thank you. Kind of nice. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was Katarina. Katarina. We, we, were, we were playing Scrabble and that came up. So. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no. so now it's gone out and it's found her. It's verified her record or SSID with the state and now she's come up. So just a little, a wrong birth date, um, an incorrect spelling of the name that isn't with the state will prevent it from verifying with the state's database. I told so. you that when, when Kristen and I do the data match of your year-end students, we find three to 6,000 students that we can't match because we're matching what was reported by our institutions to the um, system office and, and she's matching what was reported by LEAs to Utrex. The greatest, the greatest mismatch is a first name where a student typed in their legal name or their, or their um, nickname. Um, but we have, sorry, I think we had 168 students who typed in a different gender than is recorded in Utrex. And a whole bunch of students that, I don't know whether they fat finger or they transpose their month and their year and their birth date. We have students that indicate their birth date was 2015. Okay, and apparently our system, our institutions accept those dates, even though legally I, I don't think a two-year-old could take a concurrent class. We, we somehow we get that information into our system. So one of the things, I went to a meeting um, three weeks ago at one of our institutions and they said, well, we don't like, one, we do this process at, in the school. Okay, and what we're saying is we want you to do it with the parent present and in one browser session with the parent there. But if you have that child, that student, fill out the first page, first name, last name, just the first page, which doesn't require anything beyond what they know in their brain, and hit the submit, the submit button or the continue button, it's either going to go forward and you're going to go find that student's okay, or it's going to give you that we can't find that student message to which you can get that student in touch with the registrar. The registrar can get an email notification from the student for the saying that this student, and we can say first name, last name, and high school, because that's director information, is trying to participate in the concurrent program. The information they provided doesn't match. Please get with them to confirm their first name, last name, birth date, gender, and high school in Utrex. Yes. I don't have homeschool registrar contact information. You, um, to participate in the concurrent program, you must. Still, because if they say they're from like Provo District, is it going to send it to their district SSID from Provo District? One of the institutions told me, first of all, to participate in the concurrent program statutorily, you must be counted in the ADM of a public high school. If you're counted in the ADM, you must have already been assigned an SSID. If I think one of my institutions suggested that they were letting students participate before that happened, that is not statutorily appropriate. So they have to have declared the resident high school in which they're counted in the ADM. When we've been doing the data match 10 years, and you know, 10, 8 years ago we were doing it manually, we found a handful of students that didn't have an SSID at the end of the year because they'd never gone to the principal to ask permission. Goodness sakes, um, UVU found two homeschool students sitting in a face-to-face -face course at a certain high school in Utah County all year long. But, um, and when we told them they had to get the SSID, it, was, it happened like that day. So you have to be counted in the ADM of a, res, of a public high school, resident high school, to participate in concurrent. Come talk to me afterwards, because that doesn't totally answer your question, yes. Yes. As well as the school district. So when they click on this, notify my high school. If we have a high school contact as well as a district contact, we will email both of those contacts. Mm -hmm. So as a default, we have actually 
Is it also as a city manager? We'll talk. We gathered. You guys, help, you guys helped with this because I didn't have this. We have an SSID contact, an SSID manager. That's the person who fixes data merges. When you have to have an SSID merge in Utrex, I get for Utrex, that person does that. We have a, a district or a charter um, contact like Jared or Holly or, you know, those of you who are the, the district key person. And then I have in my hot little hands an email and a phone number for a registrar for every one of the high schools in the state of Utah, including those that aren't currently participating in concurrent enrollment. They were very accommodating. If that's the wrong, and I will send out an email to all those registrar types to make sure the emails work and to say this is what we're doing and here you know here's how it goes hopefully that's the right person the question that um, you posed for me is if a student has not yet uh, shoot if they're in seventh grade or eighth grade and they have not yet declared the resident high school they'll have to go back and find the resident high school they'll have to go to the principal and say can I take concurrent from this high school give me an SSID uh, Mari Sorry, I just want to make sure that I'm clear so it's automatically to you so create a file so you can have okay, junk so mail say, so I'm get 19, no, no. Yeah. O only only if their information doesn't verify and they click this notify my high school one so yeah figure it out yeah and when we had we had just sort of 30,000 kids last year we had when it does settle 10 percent 3,000 of them that didn't match and they weren't all in your district and the other thing is oh no 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 that's when you create a spam filter specifically for that UP address. The other thing is, if in fact, another thing that is, they're asking for their legal name as well as their preferred first name. That came from two of our institutions have that on their apps. That's a great way to help them understand. And if we're telling them to go back and talk to a registrar, hopefully it'll be less than 10% of those kids or 3,000 of those kids. Next and next. Go. Okay, so um, as far as paying the if they were here last year, the database will know they paid. If, and, we, and we already said, if they were here this year, and we didn't capture them through even our mid-year report, um, we will ask the admissions people for a report like two days before we go live saying, who has paid an application fee but not enrolled in a class? Okay, I just can see my students... They're used to coming to our website. They're used to mm -hmm. filling out an application. They'll fill out a regular college application if they can't find the concurrent one, and they will pay the fee. So is there a way for them to come then onto here and say, I've already paid a fee? No. Hopefully you'll point them to utahce.org. Well, they, 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 they can say that they Because they, they do have... that already anyway. I yeah. Think we have to fix at least 20 yeah. a year that do that. Yeah. It's your banner ID. The, wor the worst thing is them having to keep paying. And who, who has to refund that? Well, how do we figure that out? Um, the, the budget officers want the application money right away. They want it at least twice a month, if not once a week in August. And so the, bu the money will be momentarily captured in a PayPal account that's administered by Utah Valley, Utah State, but it'll be transferred to your institution. And that was the, I mean, I understand them. They, they want that, that, the, those funds immediately. So talk to me about it in the breakout. Okay, but there's no way for it right now on the form nope. for the student to say, I've already paid. This. Yes, they check a box and say, I've already they paid. Check a box, but they would still have to pay at this point. Oh, now, they check a box, but they still pay. Mm -hmm. in, in that case, yes, they would pay. Now, if each of the institutions could, in, in theory, create a promo code that made the price zero, and so if the institution wanted to do that, to give to... We just don't want them to pay twice. Yeah, yeah. we don't either. And that's where we're trying to preload all of the data from all of the previous year, or the last, what, three years? Three years. And this should be an issue the first year, but institutions will go into their administrative dashboard, and they will say, what is the first day you can apply for admission for spring semester or fall semester or trimester to take concurrent courses? And that... Huh? Yeah, January 1st. So anyone after January 1st is going to go to utahc.org and fill out that form, they're good. But there's going to be kids that apply, like uh, in November, for to be first-time freshmen next year, 
and they will have paid, but they will not have been given an ID yet because they won't know at the end of January they've been admitted. The, um, so I worry about them too. Yeah. Bring it up again. That's our problem. It's those kids that have gone to that college application week or something like that, they've all applied. Well, college application week is administered by, our, by Julie Hartley's people, so I hope that she can help us with that. I hope she will. I, we had a whole bunch of kids that first year that paid again, even though they already paid as concurrent students. And um, she is supportive of this project, so I, it's a really good point, and I'll make sure that she has a way to help us with that. Um, someone raise the hand. Yes, Ms. Mayor. Go. Yes. It's okay. Yes. Well, freshmen and sophomore can apply. You know, state um, statute now allows them to participate by exception, so they can apply. We, the, and this thing still relies heavily on your advising students to participate in the concurrent program. You can't not do that and, and discourage anyone who's in seventh grade from filling out the form. We asked the question, what about students that had already graduated and they lie about their, for, uh, their graduation date? It'll come up in a transcript, but if they want to pay the application fee again, that's great. Um, they're not getting in for free. They're paying the fee that they're going to pay the institution. But um, hopefully, the other thing I say is that Utrecht's data, there's 200 high schools in the state. There's eight institutions of higher learning. Our data is a little bit, our data practices are a little bit farther down the road than public ed. By nature, the fact that there's eight of us, I am not being critical. And so over time, as we have the capacity to pull information directly from Utrecht's about these students, I think it will help um, districts uh, improve their data quality with us. That'll come from the institution, not us, because we're not making the decision to admit them. It's an institution decision. So what do you get now from your institution? That's got nothing to do with this, yeah. Do institute, can I ask this quick question of institutions, and I see the two of you here. Do institutions send lists to their partners saying the following students in your district have applied to our campus to take, so they can match up to the high school kids, right? So everyone does this? So I guess you need to ask for it. We make a show, we show who's registered in classes. Okay, now you know what Daryl's face looks like. Okay, um, do you and then, okay, for, go ahead. So Sorry. I just, uh, back to the having them not paid twice. Yes. Uh, that checkbox is that says I've already paid my fee or whatever. If you can, when they check that, if you just put in a field that says what is your college ID and they put that in. They probably won't know it. Oh, well, they'll go find it. I mean, that's... Yeah, but then you'd have to verify it against the institution. We, we, we don't can't. have any way to go... We don't, have, we don't have a way to verify it. We could poll against Utah State, but we can't poll against the U. Well, right, but if they put it in, could, it, could you then not charge them and then... We, we, we have... We have two institutions that, and granted it was 10 months ago, we we're telling people to put 11111 in their social security number. So I don't know. We can't verify against... Right. You know, uh, the banners and the people saw to the institution's websites. So I'm, I'm going to vote that I'm going to do the intent of the bill and we're going to see how, how many we have problems with on that one. Okay, now, wait, no, go ahead. That was just in line with my question. Is there any way to do that for three years? If we have a first name, last name, birth date, gender, we also have their SSID. And if you've done good data practice with those kids, when they come to that last screen, it will say, it will, it will, they could pick Utah State, but I don't know if the screen looks like, they will 
already have paid. It will not show that they owe anything. It'll be as if they came back to sign up for another institution. And I did three years worth. If I have to do four, I'll do four. But three years plus this year's mid-year report is really four years of students. I think that will capture all the students. It, it will, show, it will and, show whatever institution they have previously paid fees for that we have record of. I will add one more thing, and then I saw a hand in the back. The State Board of Ed has been working with us, and they have, they are, have written or are in the process of writing um, four, five, four APIs. I think it's four. One of the APIs will return to the institution the high school GPA, general, uh, general GPA, not weighted, the graduation date for the student, and their ACT composite and subscores. That's what a lot of our institutions use now as the key factors in deciding to admit a student. So we are gathering the information, but as the institution is the one making the decision to admit, they'll have that information, they'll have the graduation date, they'll have the GPA, et cetera. So they're going to make those decisions, not us. Yes, ma'am. Um, when is this go live? <laughs> well, because, I mean, if we have a little bit more time, we can get the word out, we can get yeah. some of our kids in, we can get them working on this. I, you know what? I, on Thursday, it's really super great. The form works. I can do it today. But what's more important for our institutions is when you get a delimited file, you know, like first name, comma, last name, comma, birthday, all that kind of stuff, what do you do with it? So it's sitting there in the ether, and where do you put it in Banner? On Thursday of this week, uh, another representative from Utah State University has worked that out with his admissions people. It's going to have a conference meeting with the IT folks on our campus. So we're going through, you know, budget officers have had their say. Now the IT folks will say, they'll, they will understand. They'll probably be speaking Greek, and I have, will have no idea what they're saying. But they'll talk about the nature of this file and what do institutions want to do with it. Um, and if institutions want to treat it the same way Utah State's treated it, they'll, they will share co yep. code. Is it called code? code? Code. If they want to do something different with it, they'll work that out, you know, collaboratively. Um, but they have to know where they're going to put the data so that the computer can say, check these things, are they admitted or not? Of eyeball has to check them. Um, and they will, and 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 they will have to decide how to get it into the banners and the people softs so that the things that would normally happen if the student filled out on the campus website would happen. And so I'll know after Thursday. I hate to say, we said April 1st. It's scaring me because today is the 14th? 14th. But I think we better not say till after um, Thursday's meeting. Having said that to you, if you go to utahce.org, the third link is how do, I, how do I start? And there's a little thing that says participation form coming soon. As soon as we know, we'll put a date on it. And we want to do it sooner rather than later. It's a black eye on me that it wasn't up already. Okay, it's my fault. I'm just thinking that we can give our time. Yes. Because I'm already seeing students every single day. And, and I think we also. Give them yeah. And you should, I mean, even if we get them to fill out the first screen, that would be super cool, you know, as a test. I, I also. Okay, he and I are having a sidebar. Ask me later. I also think we need to um, create some sort of a postcard that we can put up on utahce.org that has the instructions on the first screen so they can take that home with them or you can email it to students. And I asked um, our graphic designer person to do that. She didn't quite get it done today, but she'll have it done. Okay. And I have all the registrar's emails and I have all your emails so you get more email from me shortly. You know, we did talk about that. We did, and, and state board said students was, don't know it. How many students know their SSID? It's not. I'm most it's not on most districts. Duplicate SSID is still abound in the system. Triplicate, quadruplicate SSIDs. And the nice, well, okay. The student providing it. I have to ask that question. Okay. Even if they let you go registrar, got it. That would be fine. It's just that all those, all those the registrars now also get all these emails. Probably not going to be a
300 for one high school. Um, we, you're going to have to provide first name, last name, birthday, gender, and high school because you provide that when you apply to institutions. But um, I'll go back and ask the question about to Derek Howard at State Board of Ed. But he said most students do not know their SSID, so ask this information. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let me ask, I have to ask him the question because it's his uh, API. And I wish I had a better answer, but I know there was reasons he said no. Very back of the room and then up front, I'm sorry. We don't ask for graduation date, do we? Did we? we asked yes, we did. We, we asked for the anticipated graduation date during the application process. Um, that was Shannon. So right now, the only way we have to get their SSI ID is through that web service. Name, gender, birth date, right? And the reason we asked for graduation date, the reason we asked for address, because those things are on a transcript. When we met initially in June last year with the UACRO folks, which are our admissions folks, they said they wanted that information gathered at the time the student fills out the application. Um, I don't want to make a mountain out of a molehill, but if we had 3,000 problems gathered manually, I hope we seriously reduce the number of kids that don't match because of the way we're going about this. So let's do it and see. Yes, ma'am. So uh, I'm concerned about consistency of message. So we call it a, permission, a parent permission form, mm -hmm. and then at the end it says you, your CE disclosure. I think it says no. I think it said um, application fee. Application is finished. Mm -hmm. One of the big challenges we have is getting students to know the difference between admissions and registration. So on all of our websites, we put it in steps. Step one, step two, step three. So when we add this step or replace it, we need to be very clear about what we're calling it. So whether we call it permission, permission form or admission or application form or whatever it needs to be, it needs to be consistent so that Take we that. can give our students a consistent message and make it easier. Yeah, we are very, I mean, we're very sensitive to the fact that we're stepping on institutions, um, their turf, and it is not an application, it's a pre-application. We are not admitting students. This is not a common app as was discussed a couple of years ago. But it gathers the information so the student doesn't have to go to another website and fill out stuff again. But even but if, we, if they go to the link and they yes. say parent permission form and then at the end it says your application is finished, that's sending them to well, that message. it says your application to participate in the concurrent program. I, you so know what? We caught a couple of things, and I will. You make a really good point, and we will read it again. Maybe I, you know, the center of that PPT. Ask me afterwards. I'll send you a list. Of, you know, I made a slideshow, and since you're fresh eyes, look at it and tell me what you think. I saw another. Yes, ma'am. So we I have. Was, let's. I would have missed something, but when I click on which college I'm going to. Yep. Is my only choice the one that's connected with my high school? And what if I have a another college that I'm dealing with that is not my normal? Because we have a few first round refusals where they work with another college. This is all those colleges. Yeah. Because his only came up with we were and Yes. So the institution is deciding. So right. the. So the, what my high the, school would possibly only come up with Utah Valley, but we do a Weaver class. Um, if here's the the institutions are going to identify the high schools with which they partner, not the districts, and um, for that very reason you've articulated. And I will use Jill as an example. We have the University of Utah who only serves Ames for concurrent enrollment, but now they're going to be engaged in the language immersion stuff, and it's at it'll be at two high schools in Granite School District alone. And so, uh, if that high school I can't remember which one, doesn't matter, high school A, uh, if a kid's at high school A, they're going to see Salt Lake Community College and the University of Utah. Okay. And this is where I got to be, you know, we, the only, we can't say, the only class you could take is the Spanish uh, 3116. So there's just so much you can do with a, an online form. 
it still behooves the counselors to say, here's what's available to you, here's what's in your schedule. Because we don't want them applying to the U if they're not gonna take that Spanish class. But we did get as far as saying, here are the high schools with which you partner. I mean, Utah State has a partnership with one high school in Alpine District for one class, I think. Right. I can't think of the class right Can now. Can you at least default to their main provider? Because the problem is you're gonna have a student who sees a list and they're gonna say, oh, well, I can take something from UVU or Weaver or Snow. Well, I choose Weaver because that's where I went. My parents went to school, and that's where I want to get my concurrent enrollment from. Uh -huh. From their point of view, they're going to view it as a choice. Where hopefully not, because hopefully they've had good advising. But you want to see the primary institution but first. But if you could at least default it well, to their primary click. provider. They to go to a different one. Well, they have to click three times. But that's a good point. You just have to put yourself in that student's shoes. Your primary when that provider drop down pops up and it shows them three different options. They're gonna go, oh, I like blue better than red. Probably most that's of them. That's my favorite school. <laughs> <laughs> How dare so, you? Yes. Kind of those, yes. Think of you, think good of good that analogy. Students gonna see that list. They don't understand you know, how it all is provided. Well, if they haven't talked to a counselor about taking a class from Weaver, hopefully they won't choose it. But I, I see what you're saying, and I'll see, because we do know in whose service area you reside, we do know with whom you have most of the contracts. Right. So maybe we can do that, but not today. Make the institution, give the institution the option of clicking. Uh, and, uh, I just not articulating it well, but. I just don't know how we would identify, and maybe you have an idea, is how we would identify what the primary institution is and would you have would you have multiple institutions fighting over what no it's it's is? it's actually know. it's actually our no? i-315 r-315 oh, okay. has a geographic service area so yeah um yes and no it's, it's this is what we've done this is what we were charged with doing so I, you know, I'm sure they, they've asked that question too. That? Hmm? Where was it? You Do you know what? We will talk about that in higher ed breakout again. If I, if you need the explanation, I'll grab the statute and the rule for you. It's it was in your notes from the meeting we had last week. I can spell it out for you. Memo. Yes, it is. So yes. Probably not. I, is what would the re need be? Lower numbers. If it's a higher ed question, save it for the breakout. Okay. Um, Nate? The, the primary timeline issue is that fall registration starts at least at our institution two weeks from now. Yep. Uh, yeah. Our starts on Monday. Yeah, so we, we've got a yep. bit of a timing challenge. Yep. And I, I, we've got schools that are going to manage that. Okay. So can we offer something that may be helpful for a, a previous question about the So when, when, when a promo code is created, they can, the institution can set the time frame, the dates on when that promo code is, expires, when it's open and closes. And so you can not set a, a small window of a day. Yeah. So, I mean, you do. And you can create as many promo codes as you want. Just don't, yeah. We, should, we can't set it so you can't fa share it on Facebook. We kind of, it's not possible. Can I share one other thing real quick? Yes. Um, So the files merge themselves, so I don't know if that's the 
case for everybody, but um, we might want to educate students and parents to not use each other's emails, even though they may help each other do the form. Just a thought. Um, one of the things that concurrent directors suggested a week ago was I, I think we can make a, a thing, a PDF that says here's the instructions for filling out this form. And uh, by the way, statutorily, the regents can charge a fee for participation. The, the fee is zero at the moment, and it will stay zero for as long as we can, if ever. Um, so statutorily, we could charge a fee. We're not uh, on top of everything else. But maybe on the back side, the answer is what are the 10 most common kind of goofy things that have happened with students filling out applications. Parents sometimes type in their birth dates for their child's birthday because you know, you're filling out a form. You don't think about it. And so, so as much validation as can be has been put into the form field, but you're still going to get crazy stuff. I think that... Um, I think that we are done with... Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm going to do what I have to do. Yeah. Some parents don't have emails. Yeah. Um, the, I've made three or four notes mentally, which I hopefully I've taken notes from Kathy. And one of them is the email is required, but the phone number is optional. Maybe we can, it's, I don't know if it's logic to say one or the other is required. I don't know how easy that is to do. Yeah. I don't, I don't know forms, but that's you, something I'll yeah, put can out. Can you text the verification code? No. Not right now. So let's see. I like to, you know, when you build forms, we want to see how many times this is a problem, hopefully. I mean, I asked institution budget officers how many students can't pay with a charge card. It was less than 1%. So a um, very small number of students don't have a Visa card. Uh, who knows how many don't have a phone number or an email. Email, more likely. I think people have phone number access. So, okay. Just think about no, well, today. you're the third person to bring it up, and I'll, I will think about it, but I, we really have to have that IT meeting first. Okay. So I can't, can't even give you a date. Because those people, we're gather, we can gather the data. Those people have to decide how to consume it, those folks, and they're meeting on Thursday.